Janice. Would you all please rise and, and join me in the call to worship. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. And our first hymn this morning is This Is My Song on page 437 in the Red Hymn Book. We come now to our time of sharing our joys and concerns with one another. If you have a joy or concern, if you'll lift your hand, one of the ushers will bring you a microphone. In your bulletin, you do have some names listed. Please continue to pray this week. And remember David Cornell, he's home now, recovering. Kirk Wyckoff, Carson Conklin, Dan Kreitz's cousin. And the family specifically has asked for prayers for uh, continued development and Carson's healing and for pain management. 
he's uh, having to work on restoring his arm and is walking and it's very painful. He's seven. So please remember him. Also, um, I forgot to mention first service, the altar flowers are in memory of Mildred White from their family and we appreciate that very much. Also, uh, I was contacted this week. Norma Jean Seaton has not been able to be with us in church lately and would really uh, appreciate your calls or visits. The best time is between 10.30 and 1 and 4 to about 7. So if anybody is able to call her during that time or to go by, that would be appreciated. Yes, Eli. My birthday is this week. Eli's birthday is this week. Happy birthday, Eli. How old are you going to be? Eight. Eight. All right. Congratulations. Other joys, other concerns. Do we have any in the choir this morning? Okay. Melissa? Or not Melissa? Friday. No, it is Melissa. Melissa. Friday was Lonnie's birthday. Yes. And my one of my very best friends in the whole world had a little baby boy that morning. His name is Demeek Hendricks, and it's Abby Hayes' baby. So, all right. And he is doing very good. They got to come home this morning. So, wonderful. So, we always rejoice in the birth of the baby. Other joys or concerns this morning? Yes. We just want prayers to go out to the Gelsberg community who lost Mr. Barcelona. He was a longtime teacher and community and impacted so many people's lives, both him and his wife. And he passed um, this past week. Yeah, so. Mr. Barcelona. Yeah, Mr. Robert Barcelona at and, Galesburg. Yeah, and his wife and, and son-in-law live here in Parsons, Emily and Mark Michael. Yeah. So. I believe that's the person Lucille mentioned, though. She'll be playing at the service this week. <coughs> Any other joys or concerns? Then let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come this morning to praise you, to give thanks to you always for all of creation, for the wondrous things you have made that we are able to use to sustain our lives. We give you thanks for our family, our friends. We are grateful for the birth of new babies, for the voices of young children, for our teenagers who are finding their way in this world for our adults who are working and caring for others, and for our elders with their wisdom and experience that they can share with us, that we might learn from them. We give you thanks for all humans at every age and for the gifts that you have given us. Be with those who are in need of your sustaining energy, your your encouragement, send the Holy Spirit that they might be strengthened if they are struggling with difficult decisions or if there are those where those are in pain and suffering, give them peace and comfort. Open our ears to listen, God, that we might hear one another, that we might listen and begin to understand different perspectives and experiences that people have, that we might learn from one another and that we might seek to resolve our conflicts peacefully. There are so many places in this world, God, where there is violence and abuse and, and hardship, and so help us to do whatever we can where we are, knowing that even what we feel might be very little can make a world of difference, and that it is pleasing in your sight when your children learn to get along with one another. Be with those who are hungry, those who are homeless. Let us seek to find solutions and to walk beside people who are going through difficulty. To not turn our eyes away or abandon them, but to be fully present as we continue to strive to build your kingdom on earth as we follow the teachings of your son, Jesus Christ. Make us faithful in our discipleship and may we trust in you, God your providence, your care, your presence. Amen. This time I would invite the children to receive our pelican offering as they come forward for children's moments. During the month of September, our monies will be used for the Bishop's Roundup Against Hunger. The gifts will support programs in Kansas. 
Haiti and Mexico, and these are programs that work with the root causes of hunger. We'll get it taken care of. Okay, we got everybody rounded up here. I need you all to turn this way if you're not facing me because uh, I want to talk to you about our hands. We're going to talk today about prayer. And there's a way you can use your hand to help you pray. And I'm not talking about when you fold your hands, but I'm talking about how you can look at your hand and it can help you remember things to say when you pray to God. And you know, when we pray, it's just like talking to a friend. God is our friend. And we can talk to God anytime, anywhere. Now, have any of you ever heard of the five-finger prayer? Does that ring any bells with anybody? Okay, well, I'm going to teach you the five-finger prayer. When we, when we start out talking to God, we start with our thumb because our thumb is closest to us. And so the things we remember to pray about when we touch our thumb are those who are closest to us. Who are some people who are really close to you that you really care about? Eli? Cousins, you bet. Who yeah. else is close? Grandparents? Yeah. Andrea? Yeah, sisters and brothers. Who else? Moms and dads. Maybe you have friends that you're real close to. So when you start to pray to God, you can thank God for all those people that are close to you. Your next finger is like a pointer finger, right? We use it to point at people. And so the pointer finger reminds us of people who point the way for us. People who point us to learning. Who helps you learn? Teachers? Teachers? And who helps tell you what to do when you are sick? The doctors, the nurses, the medical people. So we give thanks to God for those people who point for us to learning and good health. And your next finger is your tallest finger, right? It's taller than all the others. So that reminds us to pray for our leaders. And that might be the leaders in our town here in Parsons or Altamont or Erie or wherever you live and go to school. Um, you pray for leaders like our president, the principal at your school. Those are all leaders. Your next finger, anybody know what we call this finger? The, be the next to last one, do you know? Ring finger, because lots of times that's where we wear a ring. It also, if you take piano lessons, the teacher will tell you this is your weakest finger when you're playing on the keyboard. It's the one that's the hardest to strike the notes. And so this finger reminds us to pray for those who are weak. What would somebody be that was weak? What would they be struggling with? You like? Health. Health, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Maybe they're sick or they got hurt. Or cancer, yeah, it might be a long time illness. So we pray for people who need healing. And the last little finger, can anybody guess what the last little finger is for? Who have we not prayed for? It's our pinky finger. Well, the whole prayer is to God, but who's saying the prayers? Yeah, so the last little finger reminds us to pray for ourselves because God loves us and God is there for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, could you be a helper today, McKenna? And I'm going to ask Carolyn here in a minute. Would you pass one out to each of the kids? This is a drawing. Might need a few more. 
This is a drawing to remind you what we just talked about with the five finger prayer. And you can take this home to help you if you say a prayer at bedtime or tomorrow morning when you get up that you can pray for all of these people on your hand. And then at the very end, you finish by saying, thank you, God. Okay. Now I also have something else to help you with prayer. It's a little box. And on the box, it talks about how to pray. And the first thing it says is to praise God. So then you look on the side of the box, and you'll find a side that says, praise God. And it says, when we pray, we praise God, singing, dancing, clapping, praying. This is how we praise God. And then it says, confess. Anybody know what it means to confess something, Carolyn? Yeah, you tell something. And, and so when we confess, sometimes we don't do the things we should, and we get in trouble, mm -hmm. or we make others sad, and so we have to confess and ask for forgiveness. Then it talks about pray for others. So there's a side of the box that says pray for others and reminds us how we can do that. And then pray for yourself. That's on the bottom of the box. And it says God made you very special. Jesus loves you very much. And then the very last one is thank God. So Carolyn, if you'll give each of the kids a box to take back to their seat or to children's church, and then you can fold it up like this. You could even write down a prayer, and you could put it inside the box if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll tell you in just a minute. This is a box you're gonna you're gonna make your own box. It's to help you pray. And after she hands those out, we'll have a little prayer. Now, some of you are wondering about this box that's up here. This is what we call our covenant box. And so we're asking people later in the service to bring up a card where they will make a commitment to how they will grow in their prayer life. And they'll put it in the box. Okay, did everybody get a box? All right, let's have you, if you'll just hold your box for just a moment, we'll have a prayer. And then you can go back and you can put your boxes together, okay? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you, God, for everything because all things belong to you. Thank you for family, and thank you for friends, and thank you for Jesus, too. Thank you for everything you've made. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now you can go to Children's Church or back to your seats.
Good morning. God is good. All the time. God is good. Amen. My name is Carolyn Harper, and I've been active here at Wesley for 11 years now. Prayer became a, a strong part of my life 30 years ago. At that time, that was the dark night of my soul. I never thought the sun would shine again. But through daily prayer, my faith grew stronger. <clears throat> and I found that lying prostrate on the floor was very humbling, and it made me feel so close to God. There were times through the years that I forgot to pray. I thought I could do it myself. But then I would feel the gentle, nudging arms of Jesus to pull me back, and, and my faith would get better again, and I, everything would get better. Having severe back pain the last uh, few years really made me have strong prayer life. And sometimes all I could say was the name of Jesus, just Jesus, Jesus. Give me comfort and peace every time. In the times that I'm suffering is when I'm the most close to Jesus, but hallelujah, the good times are a good time to pray to. And so I would urge you, each of you, to pray daily and God will make himself known to you. He always will. Amen. The scripture this morning is Luke 6, 12 through 16. Jesus chooses the 12 apostles. Now during those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, and his brother Andrew, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. The word of God for the people of God. Have you ever noticed how often Jesus prays? Jesus tried to get some time alone for prayer after he got word that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded. But the crowds followed him and he ended up having a long day of teaching and, and then they were hungry and so he blessed the bread and the fish and made sure everyone was fed. Finally, he was able to dismiss his disciples and to go up on the mountain alone to have some time for prayer. He prays in the Garden of Gethsemane before he is going to be arrested and face death on the cross. In this morning's scripture, Jesus goes up a mountain to spend a night in prayer to God before he chooses his leadership team. Sometimes we wonder, if Jesus is God, if God is in the flesh, God incarnate, why does he need to pray? Isn't that sort of like talking to yourself? God speaking to God's self? Or is it a reminder for all of us of the importance of being in close and constant communication and communion with God? In Luke 11 it says, he was praying in a certain place and after he had finished one of his disciples said to him, Lord teach us to pray as John the Baptist taught his disciples? And Jesus responds with what we call the Lord's Prayer. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus prefaces the Lord's Prayer with these instructions. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward but whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
Sometimes we get hung up on, well, how should we pray, or when should we pray, or what do we pray about, or why do we even need to pray? So this morning we're going to spend a little time on the subject of prayer. First, when and how to pray. In Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica, he writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pray without ceasing. Well, that sounds like we're supposed to be praying anywhere, anytime, all the time. When do you spend time praying with God? Is it when you first wake up in the morning, when you first rise out of bed? Is it when you're brushing your teeth or in the shower? Other people like to, draw, to pray while they're driving to work or running errands in the car. Do you pray before each meal, giving thanks to God for the food that you're about to receive? Do you do that even when you're in a restaurant eating out somewhere? Do you remember to stop and say a prayer? Do you pray before going to bed each night? How we pray is a matter of personal preference. You may find praying is easier with your eyes closed to shut out distractions. Now, if you pray in the car, please don't do that <laughs> while you're driving. <laughs> we talked about that in Sunday school, maybe at a stoplight. <coughs> Others can pray with their eyes open. We often bow our heads as a sign of respect for God. Some people like to clasp their hands together or, or fold their fingers together or this is a common attitude of prayer when we place our palms together. Others pray with their arms folded on their chest or maybe raised up, palm up. I like to pray with my fingers touching. Doesn't matter. You might pray when you're sitting or when you're lying down or when you're prostrate on the floor or kneeling. It's not about how we pray that matters. What matters is that we take time to pray. And that leads to the second part, what to pray. I saw a quote that said, what if you woke up today with only the things you thank God for yesterday? Think about that for a moment. What if you woke up today with only the things you thanked God for yesterday? That got my attention. Because so often we pray only when times are hard, when we're struggling, when we're down or discouraged. And we forget that we're to pray without ceasing, and that includes saying thank you to God. God wants to hear a thank you once in a while, just like don't we all like to hear a word of thank you when someone's done something for us? And think about what God has done for us. God has made this entire creation filled with all the resources we need, everything we need to sustain life. God has given us creative, intelligent minds and hands that can perform variety of tasks so that we can have food and clothing and shelter and, and all that we need to, to meet our necessities of life. God has given each of us special talents and abilities, <coughs> gifts of the Holy Spirit, so that when we come together, we can provide that rich and abundant life that God desires for us. Because we come from God created from love. And then one day we return to dwell with God. And it's a mystery. How often do we say thanks for all that God has done for us? It's kind of funny. Uh, last night I happened to listen to a little bit of Prairie Home Companion. And, you know, in the back of my mind is all of this, this theme for our worship about prayer and about the words we pray and saying thanks. And doggone if there wasn't a song that Emmy Lou Harris and Garrison Keillor sang called Laudate Dominum. And that sounds like this real fancy Latin, Laudate Dominum. But the words mean praise or thank you to God. That's all it means, Laudate Dominum. But the words, the lyrics were great because it starts out talking about thank you for my underwear, my jeans, my socks, my shoes. Thank you for the bananas on my bran flakes. And it goes through the day, thanking God for all these things. And then the refrain is, laudate dominum, thanks be to God. I thought, how appropriate. Could have played it in church today for you. 
So prayers do not need to be filled with a lot of fancy words, with multiple syllables. Prayer is as simple as sitting and talking to the friend next to you. Sometimes folks say, well, why pray? I mean, I've prayed to God, and God has not answered my prayers. I'd be willing to bet most of us sitting here have had that situation where you prayed and prayed and prayed, and it's like, well, God's just not answering my prayers. Here are a few things that I've learned in my own experience about answers to prayers. First of all, God's not Santa Claus. God is not going around dispensing goodies based on the naughty and nice list. Then work that way. I believe God answers prayers based on what God sees is good for our lives. It reminds me of one of my favorite videos. We watched it in Sunday school this summer. It's called Kickball. And in this video, Rob Bell talks about how sometimes children ask their parents for toys and things that they really, you know, not, not good for them. They want it, but the parent says no. And he describes when his child was begging and pleading for a toy, but I want it, I need it, you said you loved me. It's kind of hard on a parent, isn't it? And the parent says, but you don't understand, it's going to break, it'll hurt you, you're not ready to handle it. And so the parent chooses something else that's more appropriate for the child because the parent cares for and loves the child. The parent sees the big picture. And sometimes we need to trust that God sees the big picture in our lives. God sees things that we can't see. So God wants to provide what is right for us, what is good for us, what we need, even when we don't see it. I'm reminded of the scripture verses from Jeremiah. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. We don't always know what we need, so when we pray, the Apostle Paul tells us, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. When we pray, we ask God to provide those things for us that we can't do for ourselves. Only God can send the Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to encourage us, to sustain us. Those are things we can't do for ourselves, but God will give them to us freely when we ask. Finally, why do we need to pray? Prayer is how we develop a close relationship with God. Take a moment to consider your closest, the closest people in your lives. We talked with the children about this earlier. Who is closest to you in your family or your friends? How do you stay close? We get together. We talk to each other. We talk over a meal. We arrange to meet somewhere to do something together. We talk on the phone. We send texts. We send emails. Maybe even occasionally we send a card or a letter. It seems kind of old-fashioned these days, but some of us still really enjoy getting those pieces of mail. And what happens when we lose touch with someone? When we've stopped talking, we've stopped texting, we've stopped emailing, we don't know what's going on in their lives. They don't know what's going on in our lives. And we begin to drift apart further and further. We lose touch. We no longer feel very close to them. There's a bumper sticker that says, if you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? If you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? That is so true for our prayer life. It's only when we pray without ceasing, when we stay in touch, that we feel God near our side. 
oh, sure, God knows everything, so why do we need to talk to God? I mean, God already knows what's going on, right? Well, think about the last time that you went on a trip with your family, maybe to visit some relatives. And you all went together, you went to the same place, you were there at the same time, same people, same circumstances. And yet when you got in the car to come home, didn't you just talk over everything you just experienced, even though you were there together experiencing it? You talked about your opinions about Uncle Harry's retirement and Aunt Sally's new hair color, and what about Cousin Rick's girlfriend? What do you think about that? We talk about these things with each other, and we listen to each other, and, and then sometimes the conversation moves on to other subjects like, well, where do we want to go on our next trip? Who are we going to see next? And maybe then we talk about some of our hopes and our dreams for our family and for the future. We bond during this time that we spend together in the car. And it's the same way in our prayer life when we talk with God, is we bond and grow closer going through that shared experience. Because God longs to hear from us. God wants to hear in our words what we're feeling, the struggles we're having, disappointments, joys, concerns. God wants to hear from us. God created humans to be in relationship with one another and in relationship with God. The holy habit of Christian discipleship includes commitment to a deep and rich prayer life with God. Back in August when we began this commitment to Christ, Six Steps to a Generous Life, we, we gave you surveys to fill out. And in the 64 surveys that we received, about a third of you reported that you usually pray when facing difficult circumstances. You pray once a week in worship. Some of you pray five times a week. Quite a few of you reported having a daily prayer life routine and that you want to continue to grow in your daily prayer life. Many of you use prayer for making significant decisions to feel God's presence and for God to be a central part of your life. This week you're asked to consider taking another step forward in your commitment to Christ and to grow in your prayer life. So I invite you to take out your commitment card at this time. And you can see the various commitments that are listed here. The first one says, Today I am not ready to make a commitment to pray. And that may be where some of you are this morning. You're not ready. Or some of you might feel like beginning today, I will pray when I'm in a worship service. The next one reads, I will pray every time I'm facing a difficult decision. Beginning today, I will try to pray daily. Beginning today, I will pray daily using a devotional guide. The next one says, I will pray daily remembering the prayer requests shared in worship. I will pray daily, setting aside 15 minutes for daily devotional time. I will pray daily and be in the church prayer chain or prayer group. You can do that online through email. We have a prayer email line. You can be on the phone list for prayer. Prayer will be a priority in my life, growing to include the following. Through prayer, I will find strength, power, and direction to face the week. Through prayer, I will trust God with my life, my family, my job, my finances, and my future. Through prayer, I will learn to love God with all my heart and to love my neighbors. Take out your pencil in the pew, and let's take a few minutes just to fill out the commitment card. I don't know what level of commitment you have had in the past, but I know what mine has been, and so we're invited now to mark our cards. And then as we come forward during Holy Communion, you can bring the card with you and place it in the covenant box.
Now, as we prepare for our time of Holy Communion, please join in the hymn of preparation found in the red hymnal. Fill my cup, Lord, page 641. we will begin with the invitation. The United Methodist Church has an open table for Holy Communion. This means that all are welcome here to participate as we gather at the table with Christ as our host. At the appropriate time, the ushers will direct you to come forward. You'll be given a piece of bread to dip in the cup of juice before eating it, or we also have trays with little cups of juice if you prefer and there are trays with gluten-free elements. So let us begin on page 12 with the invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now we continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. Gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant. My blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, and as often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. At this time, if those who are assisting would please come forward as we prepare to serve Holy Communion. The ushers will now bring people forward for communion.
Go so page 11, and we will read together the closing prayer on page 11. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now please join in our closing hymn. Found on the screen or in your hymnal. Every time I feel the Spirit. Please rise. prayer, the covenant prayer, in the Wesleyan tradition. Let us read this together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praise for you or criticized for you. Let me be full let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, a wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. Please be seated for a time of reflection during our postlude. <clears throat> 